Hello, everybody. Welcome to Session Zero. I'm Lincoln L. Hayes, and I need a haircut. This is episode 11 of Session Zero. We're going to be talking about creating backstories, multiclassing, homebrewing, all kinds of really fun stuff. We've got some great folks on the panel, including two newbies, because I have yet to recruit all of my friends to do this one project yet, but I'm getting there. We're going to get their friends. So, without further ado, let's welcome everybody to the show! Hello. Oh, I'm sorry, I got three people. Shit, three new people. So exciting. Let's start in my left and go around the grid for introductions. That's starting with you, Christian. Tell us who you are, what you do, how long you've been playing D&D. You are muted. Right off the bat. <laughs> right off the bat. That's what I do is silence. I'm a rogue. Uh, no, no. Uh, so I'm I'm like an audio guy. I do a lot of um, like I've been doing soundscapes recently, and um, I've been doing them for um, a Scandinavian uh, theater group. It's uh, uh, it's really really fun. They do like these audio pieces, and uh, the most recent one was like an interview between. Um, people on intercoms um, about loneliness and it was a really really cool piece wow um and yeah yeah it's it's been a wild ride because i started off doing it as like a podcast like fun like oh i want to i want to build sets and worlds with sound and then it has become this for me so i do that and i'm a voice actor too and i'm working on an audiobook but as far as D&D is concerned, that's like the core thing that's like kept me in this business is that like the storytelling from very, very young age, like 13 years old, I started playing D&D. And then very, very shortly thereafter, um, someone asked me to uh, GM like a, a Faerun campaign. And so I just started reading through Forgotten Realms and trying to figure out and like, oh, crap like you know i i've never run these games before it's really complex but you fall in love with like the lore and the wonderful artistry and the very cool game mechanics and how creative everything is and just all i wanted to do was to see a world be brought to fruition so i've been working on that too as as a side note on you know building my my D, &D world my world of warcraft but not trademarked that so right of course <laughs> well welcome to the show good sir Welcoming back for his second appearance, Mr. Patrick Marin. How long have you Hi, been playing this here game? And what do you typically do Ooh, in this dungeon this or dragon? This here game. Um, I, uh, I'm more a dungeon master than player nowadays. Uh, I've been dungeon master for two years in my own homebrew world, uh, pretty regularly, uh, and more so during quarantine. Uh, but I've been playing since 2005. Uh, I actually, my longest campaign, I've been on and off with Christian since 2008. I'm on his seventh mini campaign in demon mortem i think yeah oh that's very exciting when, when i'm not doing that i'm a bartender well and a, a whiskey historian and lecturer yes indeedy another newcomer to the show welcome aliza how long have you been playing and why oh. do you consider yourself the most likely to to die pc uh you know facts are just facts uh so it just happens more often uh for for all sorts of reasons i i've been playing for i think about three years now i've tried my hand at a couple of other role-playing type games before, but I had been wanting to get into D&D for a while. And when I moved out to New York, I was like, okay, this is going to be a great way to like get to meet new people. Really, I've always been like a very creative person. I've always wanted to like write stories and make my own worlds. So D&D was like a very easy way to kind of get into that. Mostly I'm a player. The very first game I've ever played of D&D, I died. And then uh, I've died many other times. So that's why I have uh, most likely uh, to die PC. Uh, I've died three times in one campaign. But yeah, I, I mostly play, but I've, I have done my fair share of DMing, whether or not that's uh, one shots, or I actually did do my own like homebrew world that I got to uh, DM for a good like six months uh, before I had to let it go just due to like work uh, mm -hmm. and stuff. But yeah, other, other than that, I'm a uh, history teacher. So a lot of kind of like, I don't know, there's like an interplay there between like kind of like love of like, oh, like I take a lot of things from history too and kind of put them into my, my uh, ideas and stories. For sure, for sure. And it's Eliza. Eliza. Mm -hmm. I will get it right by the end of the show. Just, just pretend Hamilton is is like yelling out Eliza. from somewhere. Eliza. Exactly. There we go. There you go. Coming back. The Pungeon Master. There's five of him for some reason. Welcome back to the show, Mr. Stein. Tell us a fun fact about uh, your podcast. Why don't you? There isn't, there isn't actually five of me. I cast Mirror Image. 
So good luck. Uh, uh, my did name you is roll Al the D4. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, my name is Alexander Stein. I am known as the Pungent Master, the producer, host, writer, director of the Flores Dungeon podcast on the Missing Sock Podcast Network. Normally, I am a. I guess normally. I have more dungeon mastering experience than I have player experience, but I have been playing a lot more since we finished up our last campaign where uh, Eliza mentioned that she had died three times. Well, I've killed Eliza three times. So actually, I guess technically twice and you killed yourself the other time because one of her characters ran away and then- My other character. The other character killed that character. <laughs> yep. I mean, that's I, one way to do it. <clears throat> you got revenge on yourself. Yep. Fun time. It was so, so sweet. But yeah, so The Floor is Dungeon is a um, podcast that we do two times a month. We have a session zero. Hey, that's the name of the show uh, session. And then we have a homebrewed one-shot session. And it's all based off of random facts from the month, whether it be notable events, birthdays, what have you. Um, it's been a lot of fun. We're on... As of this recording, we have seven episodes out and another one coming out on the 29th. So I imagine that it will have come out by the time this comes out. So oh, go much. back and listen to that. Uh, we've got two, we got Carla Montero Lerner and Maximilian Clark who are our guests on the next episode. And they got a great podcast themselves called Superhuman Public Radio that you should check out that has the voice talents of yours truly. Anywho, Which one of that's... you? <laughs> the one on the right. <laughs> The one in the middle that's doing all the fucking talking. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so how about you stop talking? And we'll move on to Brian now. Well, Brian Crawford Scott, first time on the podcast. Welcome, sir. Tell us about the campaign that you are in and how long you've been playing. Hey, thanks, Lincoln. Nice to be here. The campaign that I'm in. So uh, I've only been playing for about two years now. I feel like I'm the newbiest of our group. You are uh, of our intentionally today. Oh, nice. I started playing because it was something that I'd always like wanted to do, but it felt to me like D&D &D was something that you had to be invited before you started to do. Like I was waiting for friends to be like, hey, come play D&D &D with me. Um, and it happened. I was, uh, you know, at, at work and one of my coworkers said, hey, what do you guys think if we started playing D&D? &D? And we all jumped on it. And so two years ago, we started playing. I started playing for the very first time. I've had a blast doing it so far. And we've, we've you know, rotated through a couple of players. Uh, we've rotated through a couple of dungeon masters and Lincoln is now our dungeon master. Um, oh, me? Bi-weekly. Um, he comes in and takes us on an amazing adventure through currently the Tomb of Annihilation. And it's been a blast. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. I actually just wrote something for your campaign today. So get Ooh. excited for two weeks in the past from when this drops. Yes. I'm very scared. All yes. right. Ladies and germs, we got these. They are D20s. This is the most boring one I own because it's the first one I grabbed. Let's roll initiative. Also, credit to Alex Stein for getting this. Yeah. Two and three. It's a 16. six. 16. That sounds like the highest. Who was that? Me. 16. Brian Crawford Scott, you are up first with our first question of the evening. We are going to start with character backstories. For you, when creating a new character, where do you start? Oh man, what a great question. You're um, welcome. So character backstory, this was one of the things that I was really excited to do when I created my first character. I was like, oh man, I, I wanna go whole hog. I wanna make the character, I wanna create the backstory. I wanna figure out the right name. I wanna figure out exactly what class and what race and everything that I wanna play. And when it came to the backstory, I wanted it to be unique. And, and not so unique that like I, I cast, uh, uh, every good storytelling element to the wind or anything like that, but more like I didn't want it to be, oh yes, the characters, parents all died tragically and they've been vowing revenge ever since. I wanted it to be a little more multidimensional than that. And so I tried to think like, what are, certainly there is a catalyst, there's a bad thing that happened that led the, the hero or my character to where they are right now. But what were the good things? in this character's life too. How old is the character, right? I think that the age of the character, if you really take a minute and think like, how old would my character be? Can really do a lot to describe a backstory. And so I said, I want my character to be in their fifties. I want them to have had a whole life before I start playing them. And so what did that life look like? And I thought, how interesting would it be if they had like a great life? What if everything was really good for them and um, just life happened and it, 
you know, the circumstances of their culture and, and the different aspects of how they grew up, you know, religion, family, friends, all of that kind of made this tapestry of a character that then was met with conflict. And then how do those different dimensions and those different pieces of that tapestry come out when faced with that conflict? And what if the motivations for action aren't just revenge or anger or heightened emotion? What if they're, you know, a devotion to a religion or just the understandable response to their cultural background that brings them to where they are? And I, and those were like the kind of things that I wanted to weave into the creation of my first character's backstory. And it's made me love my character more. You know, as again, as the newest player, I didn't think I'd be so attached to this character and their personality and the different ways the backstory could shine through. But really that approach of, I want as many dimensions as I can get um, so that their responses to stimuli and conflict and good and bad as I play this character can be as, you know, as uh, layered as the character I wanted to create. It does seem you are very connected to Oren, more so than I would say a lot of the rest of our group. Uh, yeah. I think it's because you are the performer of our group, uh, other than myself. That but might be true. yeah, it's it's very clear that you've thought about this stuff. Not this mm -hmm. call, Steiner, our group. Jesus. Like, what am I, chopped liver over here? <laughs> anyway. Sag after a baby. Sag after AEA, baby. Okay. <laughs> Follow ups, other thoughts from the group. Uh, I, I love having the, the older character, but I will say that there is a downfall to that. And our old dragonborn in my like first campaign that I DM'd got scared by a ghost and their terrifying visage. If you really fail on that saving throw, it can age you 1d4 times 10 years in an instant. So he yes. went from being like 48 to 88 and Dragonborn are only supposed to live until they're 80. That's what it says in the player's handbook. I was like, I think you might be dead, dude. Um, that so same thing about... happened to me. <laughs> it did. It did? It did. It happened to I my went from being 58 to 78 because I, I failed that throw. And it was yep. like, suddenly my character is old and in a lot of pain, but they don't it's understand like, oh, what's my going knees on. Hurt. Oh, my back hurts. Oh, yeah. fuck me. So in those regards, I mean, sometimes I'm like, maybe I should play someone who's a little younger or who can live like <laughs> for hundreds of years, like an elf or something. I could buy it and fire the other way. There's other creatures that can make you younger. Like, I, I think, like, <laughs> sphinxes. So if you're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be, like, an 18-year-old character, and it's, like, all of a sudden, you're, like, literally a baby crawling around the dungeon floor. Like, that <laughs> could be bad. What do we do with a baby now? <laughs> I left home to avoid responsibility, not suddenly become an adopted parent. But imagine if you got to keep all your stats, and now you're just baby you, and you still, like, whoop ass. <laughs> you're like baby Huey from Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Isn't DMing just babysitting anyway? Yes, it is. Junk babysitter for life. I am always a fan of testing out new subclasses, so I will almost always make the mistake of figuring out what class I want to muck about with, and if the DM allows it, and then work backwards into, okay, so if I were playing this type of artificer, what, what kind of... Uh, how far would they have come in life to become that kind of tinkerer? What kind of race am I thinking about today? And then usually the pieces plug in pretty effectively based on... I try not to repeat too much, but obviously with race, with uh, races, depending on the world you're in, what your your DM's comfort levels are, you do tend to default back to, for me, human and dwarf more than like elf or gnome. But uh, f I always love to round out parties if I know, because I have I have been experimenting with enough different types of D and D and GURPS and and D twenty type systems that there are plenty of times where the party doesn't always think that far ahead and there's a glaring hole in their team strategy. So I- You mean I've... like mine and Brian's group that doesn't have a cleric? Yes. I've Who done one heels? with no cleric. I've done one with no fighter and one with no rogue before. One with no stealth characters. And we have a group now. One of my other groups doesn't have a fighter either. So it's like the rogue and the ranger and the druid kicking ass. So you yeah. never know. It's, it's not something everybody has to think about, especially if you're- if you're DMing for a, a much more curated group and inviting players, like Brian was saying, uh, you can usually sidestep that by encouraging players to try something specific. Um, or if you just want to be like talking to all the other players before you start the game. But for me, I don't always know. I like jumping into new games with new people because it keeps me fresh. It keeps me trying new things. So I always like to try out new subclasses. Christian, anything to add? I think when you're starting off with, with a character and, and looking at a party, when you're like, 
trying to put together a backstory, it's nice to be able to intermingle your backstory with the other party members if they're into it, you know? And I think that that's a really cool friend experience. And I, I've definitely, I've done it before. And a friend of mine, Andy, he, uh, <laughs> it was actually, it was a very sad character moment because we played brothers and eventually in this campaign, which was sort of uh, less D and D and more like gang oriented, we ended up like I ended up getting shot to death pretty much. And you know, his character, his his my brother like watched me die, sort of thing. And then the whole group like sits and and deals with this. And in in a way though, it's like it's a very sad thing to experience, but also sort of an awesome thing that goes along with D and D with the role play that kind of comes with it. For sure. And then on the other side, there was another time that I I played someone who's I found out he was my father, and then that character died. And so you know, you get the I'm your father moment and then that take gets taken away like directly after that. And his ghost is being tortured in hell and I get to see it all the time by like one of these terrible, terrible, uh, <laughs> terrible villains in the campaign. So like, I want to kill that person. And that's like, that's, that's fun though, because you have more of a reason, like a party member that you love gets cut down, that you're like, you're like in the weeds with. It means so much more to the story when they get lost. And the other thing that I'd say about when you're making a backstory for yourself, you're also like creating a template for how you're going to play the character in the game. And I think that it's important that people pay attention to like flaws and bonds and ideals and personality traits, because those are like little reminders of like the way that you're going to guide your character through the campaign. I, I love the moments that I've gotten from being like, oh, but I'm a spendthrift. I just like lose gold, you know, like I, I can't, I can't hold on to it. So I'm going to go into the shop and it's going to be like a kid in a candy store and they're going to be like, no, wait, stop, please don't. <laughs> but still, and you know, you get into more trouble that way. You got to get into trouble in D&D. &D. That's, that's the important thing. You don't, just a little bit off rails every now and yep. then. Yep. I have a character that I'm a player and I've been cursed with, uh, basically I'm a kleptomaniac. And my cleric and my party is like, I can cure you of that. And I'm like, don't, this is fun. I mean, I'm stealing stuff from you guys. And then I feel bad and I give it back to you later. I'm like, yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry. I took this. I, 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 don't know, I don't know why. I'm sorry. But I hadn't really experienced because I am, I've only been playing close to about three years now. I hadn't experienced the idea of players knowing each other in their backstories before session zero until I started watching Critical Role. And then I was like, you know, in the first one, you know, they have all of the the stuff that they've done before the stream, obviously, but Vax and Vax are siblings. I was like, that's awesome. That's such a good idea. And then with uh, campaign two, you know, Ford and Jester were traveling together and Caleb and not know each other. And they've been traveling together. I'm like, that's such a fun idea to do. But because mm -hmm. I, I'm still so new, most of the stuff that I've started has been just like, you're in the jungle and you don't know these people get to know each other. So I, I, I want to try that at some point with a new character and be like, hey, you're going to be this, right? What if we're like neighbors from childhood? Yeah. How, how would that work, do you think? And I, I didn't consider the importance of the inner character relationship with a character that was no longer in the party. My wife started out playing a, a halfling rogue and she eventually phased that character out and is now playing a tiefling druid. And as like a inciting incident for this encounter I wrote, she's killed by this baddie who comes into town. And I had forgotten that at that point, the entire party had changed characters except one guy. So he remembered her from session zero. He's like, she's literally my oldest friend and now she's dead. And I was like, oh, I feel bad now. I was just killing, killing off a character we didn't need anymore. And then I just killed your friend. Oh, I feel awful now. So he had like super motivation to go into that fight. I think that that is really, really cool. All right, Good. moving on to our next <clears throat> set of questions. We're going into multi-classing. So get that D20. 13. Three. 10, 13, oh. 3, 12, 13. I had a 13 also. You guys both had 13? Well, then roll off. It's a, hey, that's, that's my mother's maiden name. Oh. 12. 10. Yes. Steiner. Steel. All, all, right. all skill, baby. Of course, we're gonna we're gonna get right to the point with multi-classing because it's confusing for a lot of people. <laughs> I was gonna say you never get right to the point when you multi-class. <laughs> How does it work, 
And when should you speak to your DM about potentially doing it? You have to have a prerequisite stat or stats before you can properly multi-class into something. So you can't have like a 10 charisma and become a bard. You know, uh, it'd be really funny if you wanted to do that, but your saving throw is going to suck and it doesn't make any sense. Talk to your dungeon master. Rules are meant to be broken. Maybe you want to be that guy. I don't know. You inevitably become much more powerful even when you take one level of other class um, when you multi-class, especially if it's going to be like, say, a fighter. One level of fighter is always going to be good for everyone with all those proficiencies and your fighting style and everything like that. I also like, if you want to be like a cleric, you get your domain like right away at first level also. So that's also really good. But then when you start getting into like higher level multi-classing tiers, you're starting to miss out on some of the later level features that you get as you, if you want to stick like completely to being like a paladin or a, or a barbarian, you're not going to get that extra attack until you reach whatever level minus your multi-class is. So, I mean, I for one, I'm a purist for the most part. I like discovering an entire class, but sometimes when you multi-class, it's just like the weirdest shit and it just kind of works, you know? So for I'm sure. all for it. I don't know when to go and talk to your DM about it. Like if there's something in the story that really like makes it work, that's really cool. I've heard of DMs forcing like a level of warlock on somebody if they like make a pact with the devil. So that's interesting as well. It's like, nope, you don't get to choose. You're a warlock now. <laughs> so I don't know when to do it. It's just up to you and what your table's like, I think. Multiclassing could be hard like you, because you do miss out on so much. But something I really enjoy doing is like weird combinations of things. I do the same thing when developing backstories. I like to come up with like weir weird like, oh, there's not a lot of gnome paladin. So how can I make that work and make that make sense? Same with like multi-classing. It'd be really fun if you do that because there's some that are like meant to go together. But like one of my favorites that I ever did was a uh, ranger and paladin, which is a very hard to mesh class. For sure, uh, yeah. But it, it was, I had that idea from the beginning. It wasn't like something that like, oh, like later, like I came into, it was an Eberron campaign. I c approached the DM and I said, like, this is what I have in mind. I know there's these, I, it was the orcs and they have like uh, this organization that like hunts aberrations. And I'm like, oh, I want to be like Watcher Paladin and uh, Horizon Ranger. Like, this is what I'm going from for from the beginning. So I had like one level of Paladin, one level of Ranger and had to like build up towards that as I like got further and further into that class. But I think a lot of it kind of comes into like, what can you do that could be interesting and fun and engaging? I'm not a big fan of doing like, like power plays. I mean, those can be fun if you bring something unique to it, but like just doing something for the sake of being more powerful doesn't really interest me, but kind of dipping into the different classes for the sake of like making your character a little more varied or unique, a lot of fun. You essentially create your own class with it sometimes. Very true, very true. Can I piggyback off of that? Of course. I love what you said about the powerful characters because I feel like as as D D players, we're all at least acquainted with like the concept of a character break, right? Where you try to like build your character to have some kind of like ridiculous quality that everyone's like, well, that's broken, right? And so I would say that like I totally, totally agree with you about going for something for story rather than power. But I will admit that in my early years in D&D where I was like, look at the, the fantastic, ridiculous things I can build. Look at, the, I had a, con a competition with a friend from home and we were like, we're gonna go into the Savage Species Guide from 3.5 and we're gonna build the most ridiculous monster that we can and then we're gonna make them fight. And that was, that was our way of like gaming with one another. He was like, no, I'm immune to like everything. And I have whale constitution. It's like, no, listen to me. Mine can phase <laughs> in and out of existence. Sorry, and whale constitution is the best band name I've ever heard of. Whale constitution is a great <laughs> band name. I love that. No, to be an anthropomorphic whale, you got like plus 30 constitution points or something ridiculous. I'm paraphrasing a book that I haven't read in years, but Really, my point is that when it came to character breaking in like games that we played in college, for instance, I watched a lot of people try to make that like perfect crit range where double double kukris, keen over and over again until they could say, I crit, I crit, I crit. The thing that I loved the most about it was I had to beat those guys at playing the game and I would try and like make a broken character too. But then I would justify everything. I'd be like, look, look, I built, I wrote a story. And this is why my, my back stories are seven pages these days because i'm like 
I discovered America. And then after that, I did this. And everybody's like, all right. And he justified it. We have to let him do it. And it's like, that's what my character is right now. <laughs> so it can be a good way of pushing yourself to write a ridiculous story. But you know, if you want to just enjoy the game in a balanced manner, please don't break your character. Don't do that. <laughs> that's my word. Brian has a question. Yeah, so um, I've never multiclassed a character before. I actually have very, very few characters. And uh, to be completely honest, one of the reasons why I haven't is because I am a little bit afraid of what has already been pointed out that you can like miss out on things. And I like as a newbie player, I'm like, I don't want to miss out on anything. Um, so, it, you know, from the experience that's present, what advice might you have for me or somebody else that's never multiclassed before? And how do you do it for the first time? Part of the thing that I have encountered in my many, many failures with multiclassing is a thing called multiple attribute distribution or MAD, if you see Reddit threads shorthanding it usually. And that means that the, the spread of stats that you need to do well in your class is sometimes not cohesive to those two classes multi-classing together. Uh, as, as Steiner was saying, trying to be a bard when you're, say, a fighter or a barbarian, or if you, if you want a very stout whale constitution, char constitution character, and then you try and do, like, charisma or dexterity. Whales are not dexterous. Just that simple. And sometimes... Says you. Look in the ocean, bruh. Fair. I breeded it with a baboon. Uh, it's... It, it, <laughs> can dissuade players who haven't been taught about that warning sign because all of a sudden all of your rolls just sit between 10 and 12 and you're mm. not making all of your armor class hits against somebody or you're not making all of your saves by like one or two and that can be very frustrating the thing that i have found that's interesting as i start to dip into multi-classing again is mostly playing with fighter warlock and sorcerer because while I'm, I'm much like everyone who has said before, a story-based multi-classer more than a multi-classing for the sake of kicking out high numbers, it can be very interesting when you start to play with some of these things. But one of the things that is, there's a reason Sorkadins are the ones coming to mind. Uh, a sorcerer paladin multi-class can essentially just fire off top-level stuff, replace some of its own slots, and do a lot of it on a short rest. There are good reasons to do that when you're playing in a pure video game, crank out the numbers game. This panel, so far, I'm getting the feeling we're much more role play oriented. So it's not necessary, but it can be fun if, say, maybe you were born with some magic but not trained to do it. Mm. You can absolutely maybe you're born with, with it. Things. Maybe it's Maybelline. Maybe it's whale constitution. Maybe. Ah, uh, <laughs> I missed the joke. Damn. Um, threes, threes, threes. A it's, makeup it's, company called Whale Constitution is very funny to me. Uh, uh, would you buy bard. it, though? Yeah. Excuse me, do you have five um, minutes for Whale For your mom, maybe. <laughs> uh, That's a new line, it's, It can be done. It can be a lot of fun, especially if you're doing some interesting things. I am not going to lie. I have been looking at how to multiclass a Blade Slinger because I love the idea of a Blade Singer wizard so hard, and I can't figure out what to do to not worry about those top levels of wizard because I want to be running into a fight with a sword. Mm. And uh, right now, I am torn between... I'm going to give a little bit away because it's one of my next characters. It's either going to be a fighter or a sorcerer so that I can bump up some of that magic bonus, whether I want to go for throwing spells with the sword or I want to be able to fight more and then throw half as many spells but throw better spells because I'm a wizard. Mm. With, uh, I was just kind of adding on to like the idea of like like uh, having like a mad setup, and that could be dissuading towards people just trying to uh, try out multiclassing w with the, the Ranger Paladin. That is a very mad setup. That's one of the ones they tell you don't to do. If you look at those Reddit threads, that's one of the reasons why I did it. I knew I wasn't gonna get to level twenty, but one of the things you could do about like kind of getting yourself to feel okay with missing out on some of those higher level things is set up goals for yourself. Like look at the things. Like I I don't remember what it is exactly, but if you get to like levels. 12 in Paladin and level eight in Ranger, like there's some cool stuff there and you feel pretty okay with it. So having an idea of, of like, this is where ultimately like I will go and yeah, I won't get that level 20 stuff, but like level 12 has this really cool ability for, for uh, whichever one. And I'll be pretty happy with that ability. And then I'll just go make sure the other is like level eight or something. So setting up like little mile posts like that. Now in this case, I knew my character wasn't gonna get, to get to level 20. So it didn't really matter, but. Most likely <laughs> oh, to die yeah, that's PC. That's a great point. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I've yeah, they always die in first. my game, and I'm a sorcerer warlock by DM putting it upon me. 
I am uh, Arakokura, so I cannot see in the Underdark where we are. So he had me take a pact with the Demogorgon so that I could be a warlock and have dark vision. And I, I did the same thing. I, I got to the point where I got to my pact and then I'm probably going to keep going with Sorcerer and then kind of bump up Warlock as I go. But yeah, you got those mile, milestones of, okay, I need to get to this point for this to be useful. And I think with a character like Oren, if you ever wanted to multi-class in anything else, you're at a good point in Monk that you could start coming up with some other things, but you would need to make sure that you have the time and the patience to go through those lower levels of that mm. other thing to get to your milestone before you're like, all right, I like this mix. Because when I was a level two warlock, it's not really anything. Like you have some, you have some warlock spells, but it's like, I, I'll just use my sorcerer spells. I, don't, I know how to use those. But once I got my pact boon, then it was like, okay, now yeah, I have this unlockable stuff for my character. All right, let's move on to homebrewing. So everybody, get your dice. We'll see who's going to go for first on this one. Nat 20. Well, it's Pat. Did you say Pat 20? Uh, no, but I did now. <laughs> All right. First oh, question to you, Patrick. Yeah. Uh, this is great because you're, you're a DM, so this is something that you uh, have dealt with. When creating new items for your group, do you typically make something that's entirely unique, or do you reflavor something that is already out there in the world? What a great question, Link, and thank you for asking. It's funny you should mention that because there are some wonderful, wonderful magic items out there. And I'm going to use this shameless opportunity to point out Mr. James Gifford of Instagram has actually printed out his magic items on these wonderfully large, easy to read cards, such as the Whoa. Sticks to Snakes gun. I like that a lot. Cool. Sticks it, to Snakes? It's the Sticks to Snakes uh, staff idea but as a three sticks yeah. holstered gun and there's there's a whole bunch of goofy items in there and some serious items and honestly i love especially now that i've been bartending more than doing uh, any sort of acting or directing work the idea that i am essentially supporting a small business and fueling my D D habit by supporting these guys who have already put in a lot of the effort for that uh, as a dm i will say i am far more critical than i used to be about homebrewed items because i don't want things to break my goddamn games anymore i'm tired of it because i, I learned it that and i gave it to the player so i get to blame myself and i'm done um that being said homebrewing items is fun as hell if your character walks in with a seven-page backstory like Christian's and they have given you this setup, they are chasing this MacGuffin, they have been granted an item by their grandfather, passed down as an heirloom, there are so many opportunities in backstories to justify a MacGuffin being a thing. Or your character always has a little trinket that they rub for good luck. If you're a spellcaster, I don't see why I couldn't allow you to imbue that with a low-level bonus because it's a good luck charm, and maybe was a charm to begin with, but you had no magical talent. The possibilities for a creative imagination when it comes to homebrew <laughs> items are great. Just be careful if you're DMing, and if you're a player, try and make sure to explain to your DM why you think it's justified to bring in this homebrew item, or class, and make sure that it's not too overpowered when you bring it to the table, because the more balanced it is, the more likely they're going to say yes. There are a handful of Instagram artists that I follow specifically for their homebrewed stuff. And I bookmark them. I have this whole list on Instagram of things that I've saved. I bought Griffin Saddlebag so PDF. Good. I've gone through that. I made lists for all four of my games of, oh, this item could be appropriate for this person. And then also in this person and this person. But I think that that's, that's all excellent, excellent advice. One thing to follow up with, I really appreciate what you just said, Pat, about um, making sure something isn't overpowered and bringing balance to the equation with homebrew. Um, so I've only ever done it once uh, with this one character, but, and I did it, number one, I did it because I wanted it to support their backstory. I homebrewed a class and I was like, okay, I want to, or not a class, but a, um, a subclass. And I was like, I want I wanted to like reinforce their backstory. I didn't want to be overpowered. I was like, I still want there to be a challenge in this game, right? I still want, I still want to struggle. And so when I was researching like different subclasses and different ways to orchestrate things, I really noticed, I was like, you know, there's none of these are overpowered. In fact, a lot of like these abilities and things that happen don't seem useful when you first read them, if you're coming at this for the first time. And so when I put together my homebrewed content, I wanted to do the same thing. I was like, I want to have stuff that on the outset doesn't look useful 
but is true to what I think this character would have and then figure out how to use it to my advantage as I play. And so like just from the perspective of someone who's still pretty new to all of it, I think if you attempt homebrew for the first time, really try to make it balanced, make it flawed almost in a way so that it, it you know, just as with a good character backstory adds dimension to your gameplay. And I, I try with my homebrewed stuff that I, that I make, uh, I have characters in two of the games now who are just these like magical vendors that they'll come upon. And one guy has a, a magic claw machine and the other one has this wheel of fortune that you can spin. And there are all these random items that I've made that some of them are reflavorings of things, but some of them are intentionally useless items or an item that has an equally detrimental side to it. Like you can do this thing, but it takes away your feet. And you're just like, the fuck am I going to do with this? But you never know when that arrow that hits every time you shoot an apple, you, you conjure an apple in front of the dragon's eye and then you shoot it and it goes through and you kill the fucking dragon because that happened in my game. Uh, I was just going to say, like, the, same with like how normal, like by the book rules, DM has final say with everything. I think with like, even if you're making, like as the DM making the item yourself or the uh, players coming in with an idea, just being very clear with like a little asterisk at the end of like, if I need to change this later, I will as needed. Even, even if this is my idea, like I'm just telling you right now that if this turns out to be too OP, like I will bring it down. Uh, or yeah, this sounds like a great idea, but if something isn't working, like I will change it. And sometimes like that's pretty obvious with the normal rules. That's always the DM has final say, but sometimes people get very protective of their homebrewed stuff. So it's just very good to like, like, look, I will approve of this, but I want to be clear. I can change this later if I need. But yeah, I, I've also definitely made homebrew items in, in my homebrew world. Uh, There's a huge thing about like big important artifacts that I essentially just made all of them. Like I, I'm, I'm too lazy to look through the entire list in the books. So instead of doing that, I just make my own thing, which ends up being probably just as much work. But, but yeah, I've definitely had to make items that I've almost purposely made too powerful because that was part of the story but isn't uh, it funny how we do that as dms we're like i can't be bothered to look it up and then we spend 60 hours making it and then somebody goes oh that's like this thing and you're like fuck no it's not it's not like that thing <laughs> uh yeah, yours is i, I didn't blue. want to memorize Faerun, so i wrote a 50 page thing for my homebrew world because i didn't want to memorize everything from Faerun. <laughs> i just haven't yet that's my excuse they're like does this exist i'm like uh yeah maybe Steiner, you had to follow up. Yeah, well, we were talking about like useless magic items. I just, and, and uh, Pat, you plugged your friend. So I want to plug our DM, Maxwell Zener, who, uh, if you go on to Dungeon Master's Guild, he has a book called The Remainder Bin 49 and a half magic items guaranteed to bring chaos and whimsy to your game. And it's just a 40, it's 49 and a half useless magic items. And it's like instead of a figurine of like wondrous power, it's like a figurine of like mediocre um, might or some shit. And they all have some sort of drawback to them. A lot of them, I think, incorporate D100 rolls just because we don't roll the D100 enough in D&D. So like, you know, <laughs> I, I, I can appreciate that. Any chance I get to bust out the D100 and just see like how random something can, can be. I've been using the D100 a lot lately. I don't know what it's it fun. is, but I'm just you like... Have. Let's just roll a percentage die, everybody. And they're all like, uh, I rolled a two. I'm like, great, you're dead. <laughs> 58. You're probably- Oh, we weren't, we weren't rolling? Bad. <laughs> uh, I just to follow up on that, I, I will also agree and say the, it's sort of tied to what people have been saying. The book is insanely useful. The Dungeon Master's Guide, Xanathar's Guide to Everything, and now Tasha's, I promise you, even the most mundane and useless looking magic items in the hands of a clever and dangerous player are fucking miserable for a dungeon yes. master. Yep. I am. So one of my campaigns that started during quarantine is aiming to actually hit level 20 from level one. I just hit level 14 as an artificer alchemist. I now have yeah. five infusion slots and I can make like six or seven infusions at the same time. So in addition to the magic items that I've gotten over the course of our conquering, I have more magic items than I do attunement slots, but I have five attunement slots and I'm working on six. The best part is, is that the useless magic items in your collection don't take attunement slots. A lot of the stuff that's already in the book can be very clever if you think outside the box by setting the box on fire and then running around it with arrows. For sure. You can do so much. I ended up getting a robe of useful items, boots of water walking, and uh, goggles of finding. 
And so now, as an artificer slash the wizard on the party, I'm not about dealing damage. I'm about solving everything we can before we have to go into combat because I can track people with the, the finding goggles, which are in, I think, Eberron, where you have to be attuned to them, but you get a, a plus D40 or perception and you essentially get the free identify spell and you can track somebody, like following the glowing footsteps in Arkham Asylum Batman. There are some really cool items that don't require as heavy attunement or you can put them on top of whatever you've already got that work really, really well for players if you are willing to go through those pages that we talked about, all of us hating not wanting to read. Don't be afraid of the book as well. For sure. I guess where I'm going. And to, to bounce off of uh, items you don't have to attune to, recently in uh, Curse of Strahd, we met the priest in uh, Little Barovia whose son is, spoilers if you're going to run Strahd, uh, trapped in the basement, and he's a vampire spawn. So my party were very much like, uh, I don't know if we want to deal with a vampire. My wizard goes, well, it could be a, a practice vampire, which to this day, we'll just text each other, remember practice vampire? That's fucked up. Um, so they they end up going down into the basement, and you know he's emaciated. He's been there for a year. He's just like, <sighs> and the wizard goes, well, I have this, iron stone of sustenance and i was like where did you get that and he flips through his notes and he goes session 52 two years ago in the uh minds of fandolin and i was just like what so they give him the stone it circles around his head he no longer has bloodlust and he's okay and i was just like what the hell guys so you never know when that mundane item in the bottom of your pack might be awesome all right, ladies and germs, we are coming towards the end of the show here. Let's do one last roll for our last question of the night. Did I roll a D30 instead? Pat sure. 20. I, it was Critical a 10. Fail. <laughs> a 13 here. I'm going to throw away Pat, and I'm going to go with Chris. <laughs> Chris, last question to you. Yes, we see that you have a D30. Congratulations, Alexander. Chris, last oh. question. With any of these topics that we've discussed tonight, what are the main three things to consider when going and creating a new character. <laughs> what, what your character wants first off, like really, like really, really basic. Start off with like, you know, as a player, what do you want to do in this game? And then think about a character that can achieve that. Very often it can be a hard decision to be like, I don't know. And you can go with the three, you can say, all right, so combat magic stealth. Right, just ask that question to yourself. Do you want to be sneaky? Do you want to be upfront? Or do you want to be doing the arcane or divine thing? That's a good question. And then, you know, once you know what your character wants, then think about, you know, like just their goals within within their their life. Because just pushing them along that way, you find yourself like trying to lap like latch on to the party, right? and find a way to follow them. But you also have that super objective that your character wants. So when you're making, when you're like deciding what to do, then you just have to think about like, how do I accomplish that? And so I, I look at it as then you, you look at the classes and you say, what, what's the flavor that really fits this, this want? What's, what's that gonna do? And then you look at a race and then you say, all right, so this race in that class, like that would be a beautiful thing. I mean, obviously elven wizards make sense, right? They don't have to sleep, they, they meditate. And so they can just kind of zen out for a little bit and they don't, they don't like lower their defenses so much as everybody else does. But then again, you might not even be thinking about that. You might just want the intelligence bonus that the uh, you know, high elves has uh, or any number of other reasons that you would choose a race. But as you go through, think about like, you know, Age is, uh, the fact that you started off with age in this talk about, you know, starting off later in life versus starting like earlier, you know, you can start by being like, everything that I do is going to be written in this adventure. Everything that I am is going to be this. Or you can say, everything that I was is behind me. This is now like, what you're talking about is the Walter White story. I'm going through Breaking Bad again. And you're talking about literally a guy who picks up, he's a level one adventurer and he starts making meth and becomes a level 20 Heisenberg. At 50 right? or 55 <laughs> or how old he is. Yeah, like Oren. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's the best example I can think of, of like when you're, when you're thinking about a character, you can create anything. It's, that's, that's a great testament to 
like when you're telling a story in your head, because as a player, you're telling a story too. The GM has this world, but you have to tell them a story so that they can give you things to bounce off of. And like what you want drives you your interests. You need to think about what you're going to like be picking at and what you're going to, you're going to want to be asking the, the GM if you can make perception checks, not be waiting until they like get through your passive because that's the way that you make a game really enjoyable for yourself is engaging with the world around you. So when it comes to making that character, don't think so much about the backstory. Think about how you're gonna play your character first and it'll come to you. It'll come to you when you know what you wanna do in the game because that's the path that you're trying to find, not to <laughs> be a coastal wizard, but. Brian, you know. follow up. I love that. I love that Walter White analogy a lot. Um, I would say to me, the three things to keep in mind when like you want to create a new character or a new homebrew or, or whatever is, um, I mean, first we've already talked about it, but balance, make sure you're balanced. Don't, don't fall into an OP or a super weak trap either. Like find some balance there. Um, I think it's really fun to lean into flaws and lean into constraints. I think that you become more creative. Like, why why is that magic item mundane you're looking at it from the lens of constraint like there's a constraint on it but if you were to lean into that constraint how could you get creative with that item i think that's a really cool opportunity for your own creativity and last but not least i like the idea of um, ignoring your initial instincts for the creation of something i think that there's a lot of power in saying okay yeah sure uh this character um lost their right arm and so now they fight with their left arm and be like, okay, but no, nah, nah, that that's too obvious. Maybe they only kick things, right? And and like go to your second instinct and your third instinct, maybe even your fourth instinct with an idea or a solution to a problem, because that I think is one of the ways to add some really cool dimension uh, to what you're creating too. So yeah, balance, lean into the constraints and ignore your first instincts. It's the old improv rule, A to B to C. Just don't go B, go to C to D or E. Think about where else you can go with it. Mm -hmm. Eliza. I, I have two things, not three, unfortunately. But uh, one, what are you in the mood for? <laughs> like, what do you want to play? Uh, and that's where, like, like, I usually look at, like, subclasses is the big thing. Like, like I, I've just been dying to try out this, this Chronoergy Wizard or something like that. Like, figure out a way to make it work. But the, the other thing is um, setting. And it's not to get too meta with it. It's not, like, to, to take advantage of it. But like if you're playing like a, a hard broiled detective story, like it's fun to like either you could lean into those uh, tropes or you could try to break them. Like personally, I really like breaking expectations, but I want to do it in a way that fits <laughs> in the world. So like in one of the campaigns we're playing right now, Stein, spoiler alert, I, I'm a noble woman from the, the South, like escaping uh, persecution and going up to Icewind, which is not a place for, for a nice little prissy noble woman, but uh, I'm, I'm still playing in with the setting and this idea of this, this out of this way area that a lot of people are at, but setting, whether or not that's leaning into tropes or uh, specifically like trying to mess with the, the expectations. But. I actually did that with, uh, I have a human a barbarian that is an NPC in my original group and she's a noble woman and you don't know that she's a barbarian until the first time she goes into a rage. She's just this very tall, very demure woman and it wasn't until she was attacked by our blood hunter werewolf in the party that she just like hulked out and like burst out of her, you know, her sleeves. And you can see she's covered in scars from all these years of fighting and stuff. So yeah, it's really fun to, to create a character with these expectations put upon them. And then they just suddenly are just like, nope, I'm this. And you're like, oh shit, that's awesome. Pat, on to you. I can try and sum it up in three words and then explain it with an anecdote. My philosophy now that I've been working with a couple different groups and getting to play as well as DMing again is breathe, balance, crystallize. First thought, absolutely agree with Brian. Take a deep breath and don't just run your first thought because you will pick it apart and you'll get very discouraged. But you can maybe run with the gem of the idea that's in there. Balance in that start figuring out, okay, I might have to interact with a party. Where should I, where should I do this, that, and the other thing? If I'm going to have a history to this character, if they're not 12 years old and walking off to their first day of murder hobo school, they, they may have some backstory and some life to work off of. And you can, you can incorporate that into your age and your setup. 
Crystallize is really where it's fun because I uh, was inspired by listening to you guys talk just now and realized I have a perfect example of sometimes a good first idea is great because I got to play a holiday one shot two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And he was like, okay, I, I grew up on Russian fairy tales. We're going to play in this Russian fairy tale world. You're all going to be dealing with my version of Santa Claus, dead Maraz. And I took a deep breath. I walked outside and tried to think about what I would come up with for a class. And for some reason, I just pictured this chain-smoking, grizzled dwarf saying, You better watch out. And the next thing I did is I had fully re-envisioned Yukon Cornelius from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer as a dwarf barbarian ranger. And everything was exactly in place. So if you can crystallize even one stupid moment for yourself, like a chain smoking, better watch out, or just the image of Yukon Cornelius, everything will, if you, if you can find a crystal that brings you joy and it's always polished and it's right there for you to connect to as an actor, you will be able to fill out the rest of your backstory, the rest of your class choices, your combat choices, your spell list around something that makes you giddy to play that character. Amazing. Steiner, bring us home. Hi, uh, yeah. Lincoln, you, you made um, a demure woman barbarian. Does Rachel know that you made a PC out of her? <gasps> I mean, nice. she's wow. she's not much of a fighter. Swish. But, uh, okay, sorry, I had to get that one in there. So yeah, I, I agree a lot with uh, what Eliza said there about how um, it having your character created to fit the setting is super duper important in my personal opinion, you know, because when I first started running like Dragon Heist Waterdeep, you know, one of our people came to the table as this like Azamar paladin who is like trying to, with this like Egyptian flair to it, trying to find like their soul from like their past life. And I was like, yeah, but you're, that doesn't really work here. <laughs> like, we're going to go try to get this half a million gold and it, Egypt doesn't exist. So it, it made me realize that is pretty important. When, when we do one shots, that's when I like to pull a character from like my favorite like series and franchises and things like that. So like, I'll always like Phoba Jet, my Boba Fett, Battlemaster Fighter, Polar Master Sentinel who uh, our DM was cool enough to give a net launcher and a vibro axe is one of my favorite fucking characters to play because I'm a huge Boba Fett fan. <laughs> and now I get to play him in D&D &D with a vibro axe and I'm just like crushing it. Um, I don't know if you've ever done, if you want to talk about power gaming, if you ever want to do Polar Master Sentinel Battle Master Fighter together, you're going to fucking wreck, dude. Oh. Um, <laughs> But that's not like a viable character necess necessarily. You can make it work, I guess, in like a longer campaign. You know what I mean? And, you know, sitting down for uh, session zero uh, before you do things and just to figure out like what everyone else is playing. I mean, I came up with like four different characters for this, uh, for the campaign we're playing our Wednesday for Rhyme the Frostmaiden. And it was mostly just to fill in holes because I didn't want, I was like, what do we need, you know? Like, sure, I'd be interested in playing this the most, but really, I don't care. Like, I'll fill the gap. Um, so now I'm playing a uh, a druid who's sort of based off of Randy Quaid from Independence Day. That's what it is. I can fly. I'm pilot. Yeah. I just watched Independence <laughs> Day the other day because it's a fucking great movie. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> all right, y'all. This has been a fantastic chat. Thank you all for being here. We'll round things out with everyone's favorite plugs. So Christian, we'll start with you and work our way around the square. This episode will be dropping on February 5th of 2021. Uh, if you've got anything coming up or if you would like folks to find you on the line, you can let them know where to do that. If you want, you can go take a look at Dicey Rolls, which is the podcast that I produce. It's a six episode series uh, of like, like full, sound design of like I, I improv the game with my friend Richie and we played a we played D&D &D and I then sound designed that game if that makes sense and then beyond that I have Black Forest which is the audiobook that I'm working on right now and that's going to be out hopefully in February for you to uh, be looking for online but Black Forest by Scott Boyd it's you know Nazi fighting uh, 15 year olds who find secret gold in the forest it's a fun time and then, uh, yeah, as I, I said, too, I'm working with the uh, Scandinavian Arts Theater Center on their, um, their sound pieces. And their website is SATC 
nyc.org. And you can go and listen to their sounds there. And it's really cool. And I'm going to be an in information war. I think that's, I think that's it. I'm going to be a voice, a voice in Chris D'Amato's information war. Where can folks find you if they want to find you? ChristianTitus.com. T-I-T-U-S. Booyah. Like Kasha. Religion. <laughs> yeah. How about you? Yeah. So I will be on episode 12 of Session Zero, a D&D discussion next week. In two uh, weeks. After this air- two weeks. Sorry. After this airs. Um, and I'm excited for that topic, too. Uh, I also just found out that the uh, Alien RPG role-playing game that I do on the Slices and Dices channel with my friend Matt Gordon, who's a DM, uh, is being brought back. We have over 5,000 views on those three videos now, so they want us to do more. Um, So I don't know if I'm playing the same Marine or we're doing, like, I don't know if we're picking up from the end of the miniseries, the Destroyer of Worlds module that just came out, or if we're doing something entirely new, but apparently we're getting some love from the role-playing company because it launched in the middle of quarantine and we ran one. Uh, and and then when, when the world opens back up, uh, barover.com for my whiskey tasting services, or you can find me at On the Rocks most days of the week as the head bartender. Uh, patmarin.com, Instagram, patmarin, and the bar rover. Yeah. I misspoke. You will be on the show next week. I don't even know my own production schedule. <sighs> Eliza, where can folks find you if you want to be found and what you got coming up? I don't really have anything coming up, just a lot of lesson plans uh, for teaching. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but I actually, I actually I, I've been thinking about making a Twitter for a while and uh, knowing that this question would be asked is actually what broke me down to actually make a Twitter. So I now have a Twitter at the new Eliza, all one word, Eliza with an A. It's so far mostly politics stuff. So nothing really D&D related. I'm hoping to get more D&D stuff on there, but you know, <laughs> it's just like- Excellent. And what, what lesson plans will you have around this time in February. What are you, what are you teaching in oh, history God. right uh, now? <laughs> I'm finishing up my, my stuff on the Babylons and I'll be moving on to the Egyptians soon. Uh, and then we'll start our uh, religion unit soon, which that's always fun to fun to do. <laughs> Excellent. Pungent Master, hit us with your best shot. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, find The Floor is Dungeon on all of your pod catchers. Um, it's a lot of fun, it's really goofy. Um, hopefully I get some of the people from session zero to be guests on the show at some point, bring you into my time lab and have you roll the D30 on the calendar and see what nonsense happens. You can follow the Flores Dungeon on all of the socials at Dungeon Floor. And I am uh, on Twitter at Alexander Stein, S-T-I-N-E, like R.L. Stein, the Goosebumps guy spells it. Uh, and on Instagram at The Steiner because uh, I couldn't get this diner on Twitter because somebody took it and he has one follower and it's my friend, Randy. <laughs> so, you know, that- Fucking that Randy. We all know Randy from college. That, That's that right. guy. Yeah. And lastly, Brian Crawford Scott. What's up? Where you at? What you got? I'm right here. Um, if you're interested in following me, you can find me on the socials, many of the socials, uh, at B Crawford Scott, all one word. Um, and you know, when I'm not playing D and D, I am the director of instruction for the coding bootcamp app Academy. So if you've ever thought for even a hot second, maybe computer programming is cool and you want to do that, come try it out at app Academy. Uh, we'll turn you into a software developer. It's a blast. And, uh, I'd love to teach you. Thank you, sir. I am Lincoln L. Hayes, Lincoln L. Hayes on all the socials. You can follow this show at session zero D and D show on the Instagram you can find it on my website, lincolnlhays.com slash session zero. Uh, it is a podcast now, and it has been for several weeks at the time of this droppage. You can find it on all of the podcatchers, Spotify, iTunes, radio.com, Amazon, literally anything that Libsyn would let me do, I did. So get it there, put it in your ears, consume. And if you would like to be Uh, a panelist on the show, you can go to my website and fill out a survey. So please do that if you're interested. Thank you all for being here. This has been an absolute blast. Welcome to the Session Zero family. A kitty cat. We did it. Mine did not bother me. Amazingly. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a great night. And everybody go play some D&D. Bye. Bye. Hey, it's 
me again. Did that seem like fun? All that D&D talk? Well, I could teach you if you want. Just go to my website, lincolnlhays.com slash storytelling, and take a look. I can teach you a couple hours, run through the basics with you, do a small session, see what you think. I can run it for just you, you and a couple friends, you and your family, you and some coworkers. What do you got to lose? If you don't like it, it's one night of TV you don't watch. But if you do like it, you have a hobby you can play for the rest of your life. Sounds good to me. Head over to my website, lincolnlhaze.com slash storytelling. Let's chat. And thanks for watching Session Zero. See you next week.